little different start to uh, today's festivities, but we're starting here at Matt Berkey's home, little day party. We're gonna hang out here for a bit, then we will probably hit the strip, get some poker in. We're gonna hang out here for a bit. You ain't leaving my nigga, we should be popping around here, I mean. I'll let you yeah. guys know how it goes. Nah, 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 nah. This, this, might be, this might be another night we don't make it out. Yeah, if you go to strip, then I'm going to strip too, bro. This is for this. This is for this. This is for this. This is for this. She's going to be fucking some weird red shit. <laughs> supposed to be here this long. We were supposed to swing by, say hi, go play poker. I gotta tell you, it's crazy when people go into vlog mode, we're just having a regular conversation, and it's like, here's the plan! He sounds familiar to you, but you don't recognize him. This is Chris Kambalinka, a destructive force in any poker game, but you most likely heard his voice as he is the narrator of the Solve for Why quick study courses. Proper sea betting sizing is a complex topic and one that we will cover at length in Course 5, Flop Play. <laughs> I don't know, I thought we were just talking. <laughs> He's got you guys to attend to, you know? Chris K, ladies and gentlemen. So the new plan... I understand. I understand the dynamic, you know? All right, you guys, take him. <laughs> we're playing today. It's happening. It's happening. Trust me. We are. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is what? How are you and Berkey just appearing in my vlogs? That. Oh, that's us. At the party. No, that's fake. CGI. I wouldn't drape myself over some blogger. Ugh. I can't be seen like this. Do you know who I am? Blur me out. Do some vlog magic or something. I'll sue you. I'm a lawyer, you know. Um... Just do it! I'll see what I can... Hey, it was nice seeing you, Jamie. Okay, let's try this again. It's happening. It's happening. Trust me. We are. Oh, hi. All right, that's enough. We've been here long enough. It is time to uh, get out of here. We're going to go to. Uh, I think we'll go to the Bellagio. Bellagio 510, coming soon. Bye. Did we stay a little bit longer than we thought? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. It's standing up on my uh, feet for the last five to six hours. I'm gonna make playing poker tonight any easier? Probably not. I'm already a little tired. So we're here. We have arrived at the Bellagio. I am on the 2-5 and the 5-10 list, and I'm going to be honest. I'm a little bit tired. I'm not feeling 100%. This isn't 100% Jamin right now. Hanging out all day in the sun has kind of zapped me. I am a little bit frustrated still from last night's session, which you didn't see, in which I ran a Flops Full House in the Quads once, 
lost that overset another time and proceeded to drop 3k in a pretty quick fashion. So we're gonna play this one by ear. We're gonna see how this one goes. Last night at the Bellagio was the first maskless, plexiglassless session I played. That was a little weird. It's just overall feeling of weirdness. We're gonna fight through it. That's what we do. Just like we weave through this crowd. I'll keep you guys posted. I'll let you know how it goes. Go me. Go me. Right out the gate. Right out the gate. I mean, we aren't at this table for two minutes before we pick up a hand. Under the gun folds and we look down at pocket queens. I have zero reads on anyone at the table. Never seen any of them before. So this hand might get tricky really fast. We choose what is typically a standard opening size and make it $30. The late position player calls. Action folds around to the big blind and he finds a call as well. So here we go. The dealer burns and right away I see it. A queen. This might be a good session. Queen 9-4 with two diamonds, so we aren't out of the woods just yet. The big blind checks and of course I continue. $60 and again the late position player calls quickly. The big blind apparently didn't see what he was looking for and now only two of us are headed to the turn. There are quite a few bad turn cards for us, however, the Nine of Diamonds isn't one of them. In fact, I'm hoping it's one of, if not the best turn card. No real reason for me to let off the gas and I bet $130 and again get snap called. Does he have a flush? The River Seven of Clubs is the brickiest of all bricks and now it's decision time. If he does have a flush or a nine, I really need to try to get max value here. I can't imagine that he has nothing at all at this point. I tank for a while and decide to go with a larger bet, targeting his value range, figuring that even a small size won't get called if he has pure air. He must have had the latter because as quickly as he called the other streets, he folds this one. But hey, at least we're off to a good start. <laughs> Not much has happened for quite a while after that pocket queen's hand, and when I say not much, I mean orbits upon orbits of folding with an occasional preflop steal. I was hoping for that to change when I looked down at this next hand, pocket kings, and on the button no less. An early position player is open to 30, and a middle position player has called. You know we're raising, right? I make it 140, praying that the early position opener's range can stay in some of the heat, but both he and the middle position player fold without much fanfare. This is what I get for being a nit. After about 2 hours and 35 minutes, I decided I wasn't quite feeling Bellagio-y tonight. So time to move on. Uh, Bellagio with uh, Lily. 
You just cut to the point, the game there was trash. 510 was trash today. It was in the game for 1500, cashed out for 1612 ish. So I'll let you do the math yourself. The night is not over. It's time to go to the win. Let's get some win action on the blog. Coming up next. Things at the win were cruising along. The table was good and I was steadily just chipping up. Nothing exciting or flashy, no big hands, no tough spots. Just boring and steady. Until one limp to me and I looked down at pocket jacks in middle position. Those? Those are called jiggities. Thanks, Brad. I choose to make it $25. Action folds to the big blind, he calls, as does the original limper. The three of us see a flop of four of diamonds, seven of diamonds, seven of spades, and action is quickly checked over to me. Okay, okay, I can work with this. No overcards. We have some board coordination that I need to keep an eye on, but overall, not a bad flop. I continue with the betting lead for $50, and both players call. The turn nine of clubs shouldn't really change much. It doesn't really overly interact with the board coordination I was worried about on the flop, and it doesn't complete any draws. It's just a big nothing. Both players check to me again. Unless one or two of these guys has a seven, I should be in the clear. I'm not gonna check back here and give a free card though, so I bet $110. The big blind takes no time with it at all and calls. The under the gun limper though, he has other plans. He raises to $400. I don't know this guy, but it seems hard that he'd be overvaluing a 9 here. It's possible, unlikely, but possible that he has pocket 10s and he just thinks they're good. But it's much more likely that he has something that has me crushed in drawing to two outs. At best. I quickly just let the jacks go. I honestly expected the hand to be over at this point. I was wrong. The big blind tanks for a little bit and then check raise shoves for about 1100 total, which then gets snap called by the under the gun limper who covers him. What the hell just happened? I shouldn't have looked at the river. I knew I just shouldn't have looked at the river. Unbelievable. On the river, the jack of diamonds peels off, which would have given me top full house. The under the gun limper exposes pocket fours for a flopped full house. In the big blind? Well, he turns over pocket nines for a turned full house. Wow. Just wow.
over the last couple vlogs, I've illustrated the power of 3-5 suited and showed that basically it's an unbeatable hand. I got to thinking that if 3-5 suited was that strong, then 4-5 suited must be even stronger, right? I mean, it makes sense logically, doesn't it? A middle position player opens to 20 and I decide to test my 4-5 suited theory in action. I raise it up to $65. Right away we encounter an issue. An interloper, if you will. Another player invites himself to this party. The small blind. He decides to cold call the $65 in the original opener Well, he just folds. Heads up, we see a flop of Jack-8-6 with one spade, which elicits an immediate check from the interloper. Okay, I have a gut shot and some backdoor pipe dreams. If I bet here, and he calls, he will most likely check the turn, which will give me the ability to see both turn and river for this one flop bet. And if he folds, well, that works too. That's the route I choose. I bet $110. Unfortunately for me, he doesn't fold. He calls. The turn, disappointment. It's a nine of clubs. He checks, and I decide to take that free card. The river's even more disappointing. The king of clubs, and he checks again. I could man up here. I could bomb it. I could, but I don't. I wimp out, and he shows me pocket tens. Note to self, four or five suited really sucks. My camera had a lot of weird focus issues this session. Which was unfortunate, as there were a couple interesting hands that I just won't talk about because the video is disgusting. Oh well, these are just the perils we are sometimes faced with. An hour or so later and the camera issues have seemed to fix themselves. What hasn't really fixed itself is my stack. The chipping up came to an abrupt halt and was replaced by a slow bleed. I was dying by a death of a thousand paper cuts, 20 and 40 dollars at a time. I needed to pick up a real hand or find a real spot and get back into this game. That's when in early position I looked down at pocket queens. Now this is a real hand. Keeping it standard I open to $20. The player next to act calls but the hijack decides to bump it up a bit to $75. With my stack hovering around the $800 mark I had some wiggle room here but not much. Obviously way too much to just rip it in. 4-betting is an option, but the player next to me was already reaching for calling chips. My 4-bet might scare that money out of the pot. I elected just to call, let the player next to act follow suit, hope for a decent flop, and be mindful of stack-to-pot ratio. Three of us see the flop. Jack, 4, 5 with two spades. Staying in flow, I check. The player in the middle checks, and the hijack now c-bets for 125. Still no need to rip it in just yet, especially on this board and with the player in the middle still around. It's risky, but I call, as does the player in the middle. The turn pairs the four and I check again with hopes of just check-raise jamming. Things take an interesting turn here though. Now the player in the middle leads out and big. He bets $325. Obviously not a big bet in terms of percentage of pot, but live players generally don't think in those terms. They think in dollars, and 325 is a lot of them for a turn 2-5 bet, regardless of pot size. It's weird, but true. The hijack thinks for a second, but eventually calls, and now the stack to pot ratio is upside down. The only thing I can do is shove. I move in for $550. Come on. There's zero hemming and hawing, and both players call really quick. The river seven of clubs is exposed, both remaining players check, and I flip over my queens. The dealer announces, pair of queens, and there's a rather long pause. Eventually, both other hands hit the muck granting me the full triple up.
I wish I could explain this hand better than I'm getting ready to explain it. Trust me, I do. I've sat here in front of this computer for a good 15 minutes trying to come up with the words that will accurately describe what was going on in my head during this hand, and I can't. I will say, a large portion of poker, especially now, is math-based. Just knowing the basic math of situations and adhering to it over the long term will show positive results. However, there is another portion of poker that's still based on gut or intuition that can net you some short-term gains if you really know how to process that non-conscious sort of emotional information. I know, it's weird. Let's get into it. The under the gun player opens to 20 and I call next to act with pocket deuces. When the action reaches the middle position player, he decides to three bet to $75. Action then folds around to the under the gun opener who calls. With stacks relatively deep as they frequently are in the win two five game, I call the $75 too and three of us see the flop. Three, play. three of spades, five of clubs, jack of spades. Under the gun checks, I check, and the middle position player now down bets to $55. 55. The under the gun player quickly releases. But me? Not yet. I need to see more. I call. The turn pairs the jack and I check again. And again, the middle position player continues with his aggression, this time in the tune of $120. Still, something isn't right. Here's the part I can't explain, but it just doesn't feel right. Something feels off. I need to see more. I call. The river nine of spades completes the board, and I check for the third time. The middle position player tanks for a while. <laughs> and eventually checks behind. I don't really play the, no, you need to show first game, so I just immediately turn my hand over, somehow pretty confident that it was good, and I was right. It was good. It's late now, or early depending on how you look at it, and I know I'm coming down to my last few hands when I look down at this beauty in early position. Our favorite unpaired piece of shit, ace-king offsuit. There's already been a limp and the book says I need to raise, so I do. I make it $25. A late position player calls and the limper calls and three of us head to the flop. Not bad, not bad, king four deuce rainbow. This unpaired piece of crap is trying to earn its keep. The limper checks and I bet large, $75. The reason I went so big is twofold. One, the late position player isn't very deep at all. She has about $300. If she wants to get it in, so be it. I was a college athlete. I'm not afraid to get it in. And two, the early position limper thinks I'm 100% full of shit. They've seen me bluff a few hands with big bets and I think if they have anything, they may call me down light. The $75 bet gets through the late position player, but nah, -uh, not through the limper. They call. The turn brings a seven of hearts and the early position limper checks again. I really don't think I can take ace king for value for all three streets. In hindsight, maybe I could have versus this villain, but the game time decision was to check back turn, feign weakness, play into my bluffy image, and then bring the hammer down on the river. So that's what I did check. The river pairs the deuce, nothing comes in, no straights, no flushes, and the early position player checks again. I'm praying that they have a weak ace, but what is more likely is that they have a small pocket pair, hence the early position limp. What's most likely, however, is they just don't believe me. So I size up a little bit on the river and bet something that looks bluffy after I turn check back. I toss in $150. 
Again, not a gigantic bet percentage-wise, but like I said before, it's not the percentage of the pot that a lot of players care about. It's the dollars. And $150 looks big. Why would he bet $150 if he had a real hand? They tank for a while, and I'm hoping that they are asking themselves that very question. The call ends up coming in the form of one red chip hitting the middle. I expose my hand, and they muck. One of them nights, one of them nights. 5.30 in the morning, sun's out, game was good. Let's wrap this thing up. <sighs> Bellagio, Bellagio 510, eh. I think I left up, what, 100 and some change? 2.5 at the win, much better. Much better session. Started off very slow, started off card dead. We hung in there, we battled. In the game for 1500 out for 2786, I believe. But like I said, it's late or it's early, however you want to say it. And it's time to go home and get some shut eye. So, if you uh, like the blogs, leave me a comment, like, subscribe. And I'll probably respond. Probably. And um, I will catch you next time. Talk to you later. Dealing with baristas in store-bought coffee first thing in the morning, that means we're on the road. A quick pit stop here in Yermo, California. Los Angeles, California. Ended up at the Abbey, which is a, um... I've been doing everything so what I'm supposed to. Promise if it didn't work, I would be home soon. Mid-session update, bicycle casino edition. Here's your mid-session update. They're gambling. They're gambling in there. I get to wake up and make dope shit every day. And if I need a little money, I play poker in LA. Hanging out all day in the sun is kind of warped me. We're gonna hang out here for a bit, then we will get into some poker, most likely at the Bellagio. <sighs> and maybe try to bounce back from being wrecked for three can. Come on, ah. <sighs> Little bit different start from. <sighs> We're gonna switch it up. It's we're gonna switch it up a little bit today. We're not starting at the house. We are starting. All right, let's cut to the point. The um, 510 tonight at the Bellagio was kinda, I won't call it trash, but I've been in better 510 games. But the night is young, it's early. Let's head over to the Encore. The win, the win, the Encore. Which one is it? It's time to go see someplace else. We're gonna head over to the win Encore area. See if we can get into another game. That's it. 
that's your kind of your mid-session update actually that is the mid-session update